Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita nam pavan ebyo Vaishnavibyo namo namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadigor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we'll begin by chanting the invocation mantra and then the first three mantras of the Ishopanishad. You can repeat after me. Om Purnamada Purnamidam. Purnat Purnamodachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Isavasyam idam sarvam Yat kincha jagat yam jagat Tena chak tena bunjata Magrida kashasvetanam Kurvane baha karmani Jijivi chak chatam sama Evam tvai nanate tosti Nakarma le piate nare Asuriya namate loka Antena tamasarvita Tamste pretya pekachanti Ekachat mahanojana So in the last class we spoke about how if we follow the process given by the Lord, we can have a long life, right? Mentioned, we may live for hundred, hundreds of years, the, the verse says. But we have to work according to the Lord's plan. And that was known as the is, Ishyavashya system, Ishyavasya method, with God in the center. So this is the subject matter of the first three mantras of the Ishopanishad. It's dealing, dealing with the question of proprietorship. We want to understand who is the proprietor clearly. And when we work in that way, then we get very good results. But of course it's not an easy thing for us to purify our consciousness, to correct our consciousness and 
to recognize Krishna as the proprietor, it, that's really difficult because we have we all have the tendency well we're conditioned souls right we're conditioned and who would like to tell us what does it mean to be a conditioned soul anybody can say when i say we're conditioned souls what does it mean yes yes prabhu Yes, can you tell? Oh. Okay, so we're we're controlled by the, the three modes of nature. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. And how does the three modes of nature how do how do how do they influence us? What is, what, what is the consciousness of somebody working under the three modes of nature? Okay, yes, the four defects. Would you tell us, please, the four defects? Yeah, our subject to illusion. We have the propensity to cheat or we're being cheated. We have imperfect senses and we make mistakes. Right, so four defects, these are there in the conditioned soul, not in the liberated souls, but the conditioned souls because we're under the modes of nature, because we're under the influence of the material energy, we make these kind of mistakes, right? What did we say was the, the illusion? What's the big illusion of people, conditioned souls in the material world? Yes, yes, right. Thank you, Mataji. Yeah, we're thinking we're the body. This is a problem, right? We're thinking, I am this body. And then when we think, I am the body, then what's the next thing? What do we think after that? What comes next? First we think, I am the body, and then we think? Yeah, right. We're thinking, I am the proprietor, right? This is mine. We say, aham and mamiti, aham I, and mamiti, this is mine, this belongs to me. This is the conditioning of the material energy. We think of this world as being for our enjoyment, right? Bhagavad Gita described the energy of the Lord and how we are, we are, we are struggling with the five senses and the mind. Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Buddha Sanatana, Manasha Stani Indriyani, Prakriti Stani Karshati. Right? Prakriti Stani Karshati. We're struggling with the Prakriti, with the material nature. And why are we struggling with the material nature? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the chapter in chapter seven, Apariyamitas Twanyam Prakritim Vidime Param Jiva Buddha Mahabaho Yedam Daryate Jagat. Yedam Daryate Jagat. We're because we're trying to control, we're trying to lord over the Prakriti. We're thinking it's all mine and it's here for me to enjoy. 
right? So when we remember that we're not the proprietor, that we're simply the, the servant and the Lord is the actual proprietor, then it has a very good effect on us. The whole situation of the world can change. And we were hearing in the last class how you can be a communist or you can be a philanthropist or a humanitarian worker, social worker, and you can do it all in Krishna consciousness. There's no harm. Everything can be done in Krishna consciousness. So this, this is the meaning of the Ishyavasya society. Krishna consciousness is meant for this. Our Krishna consciousness movement is meant to promote a, an Ishyavasya spirit, that the devotees of the Lord will live together with God in the center recognizing everyone, working together cooperatively. And when we have that spirit, then we can live a long life without trouble. However, not everybody is able to do that. So we're going to go on now to Mantra 3, right? We will, uh, let's go through it here. Where are we? Maybe we can have somebody read. Uh, hmm. Prasanna Chitta Gopinath Prabhu, is he here today? Could you read the translation, please? Have we got the screen sharing for everybody? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So what about... Uh, Praman, Pramananya Gopesh, Hare Krishna Prabhu, would you like to? So we're going to hear an interesting phenomena, the killer of the soul. Now this sounds contradictory to what we have heard from the Bhagavad Gita, right? When we studied the Bhagavad Gita, we heard Najayate Mriyate Vakadachin, right? For the soul, meaning, what's the meaning? Right. For, for the soul, there's no birth and there's no death. But here, the Ishopanishad speaks about the killer of the soul. So, we're going to, we have to understand what is the meaning behind this. Because somebody kills the soul, then it says his destiny is not good, whoever he may be must enter into the planets known as the worlds of the faithless. So at least he's still got some existence. Although the soul is killed, but he's put into, he's just put into some unpleasant situation, some planets which are full of darkness and ignorance and described as the worlds of the faithless. So it doesn't sound very pleasant, hmm? right? Devotees certainly wouldn't be attracted to go there, but devotees are not killers of the soul. There's another class of people who are killers of the soul. We're going to hear about them. Prabhu, you can re continue reading paragraph here.
All right, thank you, Prabhu. Maybe you could tell us something. What is meant here is that the human life is distinguished from animal life due to its heavy responsibilities. Could you explain to us what, what is in the meaning here of this heavy responsibility of the human life? Okay, we have a response, that's interesting, yeah, that not only do we have responsibility towards our own self in terms of our destiny and how we make, how, how we live in this world, but we have a duty also to maintain other forms of life, other living entities. All right. What about animal life? What, is, what happens in animal life then? Yes, we hope. <laughs> we... Right, animal life is simply based on the animal thinking, where is food, right? They wake up and they go and where is their food? The birds and the, the insects and the dogs and they only know about these things, eating and sleeping and mating and defending. They don't have any other, uh, they're, they're not developed in consciousness like the human life. The human life, they can make arrangements to produce food. We, can, we see around the world how the human beings, that they are able to cultivate uh, the land and produce crops. You don't see animals doing that. Animals are not productive in that sense. They can eat, and they can sleep, and they can mate, they can do, but they can do it, they don't take any, uh, they don't, you don't see them doing things like organizing themselves to, to produce food. So this is the point, the duty of human life. So Prabhupada makes the point that there are two kinds of souls. You have the Sura and the Asuras. In the Bhagavad Gita, that's also mentioned, in the chapter 16, you have the divine and the demoniac nature, right? There's the divine nature and the, or the Sura and the Asuras. What makes the difference between the suras and the asuras? Would someone like to tell us how some difference there between the two? Okay, so the asuras are, they oppose the, the authority of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what about the attitude towards scriptures. How do the demons view scriptures? Yes, they're also not, they don't like to follow the scriptural authority. They have their own ambitions and their own plans. They're always opposing. Try, sometimes there's challenges between the devas and the de and the demons, the demigods and the demons, they fight each other and sometimes Lord Vishnu has to come and help the devas to establish their authority over the demigods. Okay, so that's it, there's, there's that kind of mood there. And in, in the, within the universe that's there and even among human beings, among, among human beings on this planet, 
we see there are two types of humans. That some humans are godly, they're very pious and respectful, and they work in that mood, and there's others who are very much against that. They're very impious, and at the same time they're very materialistic, and we see, for example, how the demons, like Rabin, he had a wonderful kingdom, very opulent, very powerful. So demons also, you know, they're very successful materially. But their success is always temporary, doesn't last for long. And ultimately they're destroyed because they're opposing the Supreme Lord. So throughout the universe, there's only these two types of human beings. We'll go ahead, someone, let me see who's next to read. Now we have um, Dina Pavna. Dina Pavna is there. Yes, Prabhu. Okay, if he's not able to be here. Can we hear you? Yes, please. No. Well, you, I think I think you missed something. Yeah. Yes, intelligent human beings. Yeah. All right, thank you, Prabhu. Yes, so Srila Prabhupada is giving the very important example here. How does he compare the human body? Right, it's like a boat. So you have a boat. Is, is, is that enough to cross the ocean? You just, if, if somebody comes with a boat and gives you a, a nice boat, are you just going to go on the boat and try to cross the Right, and who is the boatman? And Prabhupada also mentions the Vedic scriptures as well. It said they're all right. And no, uh, the, no, he says the Vedic scriptures and the acharyas or saintly teachers are all compared to expert boatmen. And then he says the facilities of the human body are the breeze, right? So what are these facilities? Yes, somebody? I 
Hare Krishna. Yes, I think. Yes, good. Yeah. And what? Some more? I think so. Yes, right, to read the scripture. Hmm? Okay, very good, yes. So, Prabhupada said, with all these facilities, if we don't utilize his life for self-realization, if we don't take up So, if we don't make, if we don't take advantage of the human life, then we are atmaha, killer of the soul. It's a great waste. We've been given the valuable human life and we don't use it properly. So it's very bad. Hmm? In, in Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada talks about, in, in, in one purport, in the second chapter there, where Arjuna is describing his situation, that he says, Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava, that because of miserly weakness, I'm confused about my duty. So Prabhupada discusses there, there is a Brahmana, and there is, on the other hand, who is who's the opposite of the Brahmana? What's the word used? If, yes, what? Kripana, right, Kripana, right. Brahmana and Kripana. The Kripana is the miserly person. Brahmana, this, you know, he will take advantage of whatever he's got to use it. He's generous and he will use everything properly for the Lord. But the Kripana, even he has money, he just likes to smell it. He doesn't use it. So that's not good. <laughs> you like to count it, you don't spend it. So that's the Kripana. So this is like Atmaha, killer of the soul. He's not made proper use of the soul. He's got a human life and the soul is there in the body and you're not using, you're not recognizing the need of the soul. So this is very uh, bad situation, very dangerous situation. Dangerous because, as Ishupanishad says, he's going to enter into the darkest region of ignorance, to suffer perpetually. That's also mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, that they go into the, they enter into the lower species of life and suffer birth after birth. Why? Because that's what they want. They don't want, they don't want anything more, they just want that. So Krishna fulfills their desires. Krishna gives all of us independence. Whatever we want, he will put us into that situation. All right, let's have someone else read the next paragraph. Uh, uh, Sampati Prabhu. Is he here? Sampati Rama, Rama, what's it, Ramabhadra? Oh, Surapati, sorry, Surapati. Yes, please, please.
Okay. Yes. So how, how true this is, even today we know there's always the threat of unemployment. You know, so many people have lost their jobs due to this uh, pandemic situation because a lot of businesses have been affected. Tourism has stopped and tra travel has stopped so much, so, so many people are unemployed. It's become even more a threat today than ever before. So this is the laws of nature. <laughs> Though people are willing to work hard, but they can't find a job. So this is a problem in the modern civilization. We ask people, come and work for Krishna, take an interest in self-realization. But they prefer just to work, to fill the belly. And we say, well, you come and work for us, we'll feed you. <laughs> but no, they don't want that. They want to be independent of Krishna. So, the duty of human life is special. The, the animals, they also have their needs. Early in the morning, you can hear the birds and the, all the different creatures, they're all asking where is the food and they're busy looking for their food. They fly around and run around. Even the insects come crawling, looking where is their food. And somehow or other they find something. So human beings, we're given facilities. We've got better facilities. We've got our apartments and we've got cars and we've got schools for the children and hospitals when we get sick and there's transportation systems some places you have some cities you have the underground train and we have communication with different telephones and so on so this is all part facilities given for the human life so Srila Prabhupada argues, just like a man in the government, he gets better facility. Why does he get better facility, Surapati? Why has the government officer got better facilities than others? Yeah, right, he's got the... What, what, what responsibility has he got? Yeah, well, right? What, what are these duties in the, in, the, in, the, in the company or in the government office? Yeah, he has to make sure no, no inefficiency. He has to make sure no corruption. Everything, everything should be done properly. Just like if the, if the man is working in the factory, then he has to make sure the industry is productive and can make a profit. This is all part of the responsibility of the, you know, the, the managers and they're given more reward because of their greater responsibility. So in the same way as human beings, we're given also greater facilities, but we have very important duties to fulfill. We're not meant for just to only fill the belly that we're, we have a purpose in life. We're, as somebody said this morning, as we heard this morning, we have to take care of the other living entities. We're, we're given dominion over other forms of life. Not that we're meant to just kill them and eat them. We're meant to protect them. And we're also meant to fulfill our own duty in researching and understanding the Absolute Truth. So self-realization is very important. This is part of human life.
to know who I am, why I'm here, and what will happen to me at the time of death. Okay, we'll go ahead. Uh, who's next here? We have a... Uh, uh, Next, we will hear from Janardhan, is it? Gidanan Janardhan, yes, right, Gidanan Janardhan. Yes, thank you, Prabhu. So, Srila Prabhupada describing what happens when we don't take advantage of the human form of life. The people are forced to work hard, work to work like animals, to pull heavy loads. Sometimes we see in the streets how people have to pull the heavy load, work hard like asses or bulls. So human life is not really meant for that. Of course we're not meant to be lazy, but we're, we're not also meant to work like asses and bulls. We're meant to make proper use of our life. And so the result of people developing the demonic or the asuric qualities is that they go into the lower regions and in, in these lower regions then they have, to tr they have to take birth in these degraded species of life and work hard in ignorance. So we have to recognize what is our duty as a human being. Human life, the responsibility, and if we don't take it, then it, then we don't need the human life. Then we're given some other form of life. We're put into some other species of life. We don't like to be a human being. We, some people, oh, Srila Prabhupada was in America and he was talking about how the dog life, that it's not a pleasant life, it's very miserable life in the body of a dog. But one young American man was arguing, he said, well, I don't think it's so bad. I think dogs are all right, they do all right, they just run around and play and with each other and, you know, they have a good time. And so Prabhupada said to him, they said, then I give you my blessing. If you like to be a dog, then become a dog. You know, sometimes people are very ignorant, they don't see the misery which is there in these lower forms of life. But there is, there is a lot of misery in the other forms. Misery is there in all forms of life, but the human form of life is special because we have the opportunity to solve the misery, to get out of this situation. It's very difficult for the animals to get out of their conditioning. Right? So next person, uh, who is it? Jai? Jai Tirthamai. Jai Tirthamai Mad. 
Oh, jot in my head, jot in my head, right. Yeah. Jot in my head, Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Please read for us in the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you, Prabhu. So, Srila Prabhupada is referring to Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, there, after Arjuna had asked the question about what happens if I take up this process and I'm not successful. So, the, Arjuna's question is very relevant because all of us will wonder like that. You know, we make sacrifices to study this knowledge, we make sacrifices to chant Hare Krishna, we give a lot of time for these activities. So what happens if we're not successful? Arjuna wanted to know, because there's no telling that we'll be able to be perfect so that we can go back to Godhead. So what will happen? So Lord Krishna explained, who, who knows, anybody remember from Bhagavad Gita chapter 6? Lord Krishna explained two situations, one is practiced for a short time and one practiced for a long time, right? 
What happens? Somebody practiced for a short time, but not successful. Now, why would he not be successful? Can you give, could, would any of you like to say, somebody practiced yoga, but he wasn't really successful? What could be the problem? Okay, so can you tell us more specifically what kind of thing could happen to somebody? What kind of things Maya could arrange to cause them to fall down? I'm sorry, Mariji, I couldn't hear. I think you answered twice, but I couldn't hear either of them. What was the first thing you said? Yes? Because of material opulence. Hmm. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Wait, I'm not finished. I'm, wait, I'm not finished yet. I'm still talking to Madhiji. I'll talk to Madhiji a bit more. So Madhiji, you said material opulence would be the cause of fall down? What? Well, I don't know if that's really correct to say that material opulence could be the cause of fall down, but, but there's a, what, what, what is the danger with material opulence? Yeah. What does Krishna, do you know the verse in the Bhagavad Gita, what does Krishna say? There's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Bhogai Shwarya Prasaktanam. Can you tell me the translation? The translation reads that in the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and who are bewildered by such things, that the resolute determination for devotional service does not take place. So, it, so it's not that opulence is the cause of the fall down, but the problem is, what? What's the problem? Yes, attachment. The mind becomes attached to it, we become bewildered by it. And the result is, what happens? We forget Krishna. Hmm? We become proud of our... So that's one cause of fall down. Hmm? There are other causes, right? Prabhupada gives an example about Bharat Maharaj. What happened to him?
Right. Yeah. So, how does that apply to us? You know, I mean, we're not going to go like Bharat Maharaj. We're not going to. It's unlikely that we'll go to the Himalayas. <laughs> you know, he went all the way up to Gun Gunduki, where the Shaligram Shilas are there in the Himalayas. Have, have any of you been up there? Have you been up to Gunduki there, the Gunduki River? Then there's a place, that's where the Shaligram Shilas are found. Anyway, he was up there meditating, doing his yoga, but he got attached to a deer. So, we could also get attached to, you know, we get attached to a dog or a cat. We become attached to these things. And even, you know, maybe we don't have a, a dog or a cat, but we have a car. We get very attached to cars. <laughs> and we get attached to our home. Just like the birds, they build their nest. We have our home. We become very attached. Hmm? So we think of these things at the time of dying. We think of our family members. We think of the children. Or you have grandchildren, you think of them even more. So this is why we fall down. This is what we don't remember Krishna. We forget about chanting, we forget about worshipping Krishna, like Jad Bharat. He forgot everything, he forgot. He was, he was doing it, but he was thinking more about the deer. Anyway, because he had practiced for some time and he was already advanced, but somehow he fell down. So Bhagavad Gita describes somebody practices for a short time. So what will happen to them? Okay, look at the higher planets, why? The Lord gives them, they want material enjoyment, so it puts them in the, the heavenly planets and they can enjoy there, right? And then what happens? They just stay in heaven, enjoying there? Yes. And where do they take birth? What kind of family? Yes, right. Why? Why do they take why do they take birth in a in an aristocratic Yes, from the beginning of the life, they'll have the chance, they'll have the opportunity to get good education and to learn about self-realization. They'll be put into a situation where there's no real material problems and they can focus on self-realization. Okay? So they practice for a short time, but because of some attachment, some worldliness, some material desires, they were not successful. But somebody else, he practiced for a long time, like Jad Bharat, Bharat Maharaj, he practiced a long time, but still not perfect. So what happened to him? What? Right. They take birth in a family of devotees. So that from the beginning of the birth, they have the opportunity to hear the glories of the Lord and to, to take
taste prasadam, to see the deities, all of these things. So, makes it very easy for one to become God conscious when you're born into that kind of family, good family. We have many devotees, you know, a lot of devotees and, you know, coming from non-Hindu families like in Russia and China and so on. So for them sometimes very difficult, even though the ladies may like to practice, it's very difficult because their family members are not supportive. The family members will oppose. The family members want, they don't want this, they don't encourage it and they certainly don't support it. So it's, it's very difficult to be born into that situation. Of course, we could say, well, that's karma. Just like Prahlad Maharaj, it was difficult for him also. Prahlad Maharaj was born in a family of demons, but still he could be Krishna conscious. But, of course, at, at the risk of his own life, his father tried to kill him in so many ways. So these things happen. Even today, devotee, to be a devotee in, in a non-devotee family is very difficult. So, suchi nam srimatam gehe yoga vrashta vijayate. Right? That they're born in a good family and then they have the opportunity to perfect their life again. So, this, uh, we see that devotional service, whatever advancement we make, is never lost. And we're given the opportunity to continue in the future. Even somebody takes a little prasadam, it qualifies them for more service in the future. And if one makes an attempt, to become God realized, then you're sure to get a good birth. But if somebody doesn't even make an attempt, if he's so materialistic, so much attached, then they're put into the darkest region of hell. So then Prabhupada refers to the, the demonic nature uses this word, Atma Sambhavita. Atma Sambhavita, they're, they're satisfied in them, themselves. They're very proud and confident of themselves. Although they're very foolish, although they're very ignorant, they think they know everything. They think they're very great and they know everything. And they're not afraid of anybody. They're not afraid of death. They, they don't care about God. So like that. So these are, this is the demonic nature. So these people are asuras, and they don't have any, they don't have any appreciation for the Ishyavasha society. They don't recognize the Lord as the proprietor. They want to be the enjoyer. So this is the situation. We'll just finish the purport here a little more. Uh, yeah, so who would like to read? Maybe some manager can read for us. Uh, yes. Okay, so we're meant for solving the problem of material life. How are we going to solve this problem? What's the solution? How are we going to overcome the laws of nature? We've been placed by the laws of nature into material life. How can we solve the problem?
Yes? 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 And in, in relation to this section of the Ishopanishad, what is the recommendation? No, for the first three verses, they're all talking about what? We heard the, the, the first verse, the second verse, they were proposing the Ishyabhasya system, right? And then the, the third verse is describing those who don't follow Ishyabhasya, right? So, so how can we make, how can you improve your Ishyabhasya? Your, your, your application of the Ishavasha principle in your life. Yes? Okay. Yeah, that's nice. But, but, but he, you know, you're, you're putting a lot, you're putting it all onto the spiritual master, right? We have to, we have, we, we have to be, we have to be a little thoughtful ourselves, you know, and use our own initiative. How are you going to apply this Ishyavasya principle and give pleasure, how will you give pleasure to your spiritual master? You know, you can't just turn to your spiritual master every moment. That, oh, Guru De, tell me, you know, you have to think for yourself. How are you going to apply this Ishyabhasya principle? So can you can you tell me some things then? What is, what is the instruction of your spiritual master? What have you learned from Prabhupada's books? What are you supposed to do which show the Ishavasha principle as distinct from people who are not following the Ishavasha principle? So how are you going to please the devotees? How are you going to please Guru and Krishna? What are you going to do? Okay. You're going to do... Yeah, but... But, but you can't do that all day, right? You've got other things to also do. I, I would like to know how you apply everything in your... You know, and the Aishyavasha's principle. How did Prabhu? How did, how did Prabhupada apply? Do you know? Do you have you any idea? Any examples about how Prabhupada was very much conscious? So, how about us? How could we apply? How could we follow Prabhupada's example? How, how you, how, can, can you tell me how you're going to get detached from material things? What you got to do? What are you going to do? But you, you may still...
Well, what about those who, other people who are not devotees? Are you going, do you care about them? Okay, now we're hearing something. Okay, you'll give them prasadam, right? This is actually what what is the duty? You know, we we're talking about prescribed duty, right? The prescribed duty. So, you know, what is your ashram? Which ashram do you belong to? Are you are you brahmacharini or grihastha or vanaprastha or so? Okay, so you're a grihasta. So what is your duty as a grihasta? How do you perform prescribed duty? So you're not going to preach until you can practice first perfectly yourself. Oh. You might be a long time before you do any preaching. Right? If you So anyway, Srila uh, Prabhupada explains that according to Vedic culture, one of the duties of the Grihasta is that when they prepare food, they should open the door and they should go outside and call out, food is now ready in my home. If anybody is hungry, you can come and eat. Please come, take food. And Srila Prabhupada Srila Prabhupada explains, he said, the, the duty of Grihastha is to make sure nobody goes hungry. Even, he said, if, even, even if there's a lizard, they'll feed it. And, and he gives the example about his own father. His father had a cloth shop. He was selling cloth. So he was keeping cloth. So what did he do? Do you know? Well, he would put a bowl of rice out every night. He would put a bowl of rice every night. Who did he put it out? Who's, who's that for? Yes, for the rats, right? Calcutta. Prabhupada's living in Bara Bazaar there. He got a lot of rat there. <laughs> you saw every night he'd put the bowl of rice and the rats would come, they'd eat the rice, they wouldn't eat the cloth. You know, like that, this one, it's a simple example. And he said also, he said in his home, he said every day, there'd be four or five guests every day. And he said his father was not a rich man, but it was just how his father behaved, that they lived like that. You know, they followed the Vedic culture. And he, he would always have people come to his home to take food. You know, this, this is uh, something of the, the duty, prescribed duty of the Grihasta, to have guests, you know, not that, you know, Grihasta sometimes, oh, I don't want anybody coming, don't bring anybody to our home, <laughs> you know. Sometimes they want to be very private like that. But actually the duty of householder life is to have guests come and to, to feed them and like that, to invite guests. So this is uh, prescribed duties.
This is Ishavashimud, the Ishavashimud. They have something, you know, it's not just for my enjoyment, but we recognize Krishna as a proprietor. Another example, Prabhupada was very conscious about not wasting things. He didn't like to see anything wasted. Even one morning we were walking with Prabhupada and we walked past the house and the tap was running and there was nobody there, but the water was running. Prabhupada sent the devotee, he said, go and turn that water off. He didn't like to see the water running and just being wasted. So he was very conscious, this is Krishna's energy, we have to take care of it. And even <laughs> Prabhupada was so frugal that when people would write to him, you know, in the, in the days when we had snail mail, you know, snail mail, you know, takes a long time to come. So everything is sent, everything would be sent in an envelope. Prabhupada would open the envelope and he would, he would unfold the envelope and he would write on the envelope. He'd make his notes on the envelope. He wouldn't waste even a, a tiny scrap of paper. He was so conscious, this is Krishna. And I remember here in Mayapur, how in Mayapur, if somebody went out of the room and left the lights on and the fans running, then Prabhupada would, would get upset. He said, nobody's in the room. He's leaving the lights on and the fans are running. He said, what, why is he wasting Krishna's, why, why is he wasting Krishna's energy like this? So like that, Prabhupada had that kind of consciousness, you know, to be very careful about everything, not to waste things and not to, uh, not to unnecessarily take more than what we need, right? That's discussed in the Nectar of Instruction, that is the uh, Atyahara. Not only eating more than necessary, but collecting more than necessary. Of course, we have to have certain needs, you know, like a woman. Women need more clothing than a man. You know, the average woman, we will ask Matt one, maybe, maybe a Mataji can tell us, how many saris do you have? Or maybe maybe not saris, but you know, Punjabi suits or whatever you're wearing, gopi dresses. You know, the average woman, Prabhupada said, will not be happy unless she has at least, how many, maybe 30 saris? Maybe 30? More than 50, oh my goodness, oh. <laughs> so, so opulent, just see. But, but for a man, of course, a man, it won't be quite, you know, the man will have, uh, you know, a few pairs of trousers, you know, <laughs> doesn't have much, most men. So, like that, you know, we, we want to be a little conscious, you know, not over collecting. I, I, I had the experience, I, I went in someone's house one time there in the Middle East, and I went in, my goodness, I thought, I thought I was in a shoe shop. There were so many shoes, you know. <laughs> and they were all shoes, one lady, you know, all, one lady's shoes. They had so many shoes. Different colors, different styles. So like that, you know, this is Achihara, over collecting. You know, of course, women, they have, they have need, they have to have certain needs that maybe may be justified. But Ishavashya, we want to be a little conscious that God's in the center and recognize everything belongs to Him and try to be economical in our use. And certainly with food, we don't waste it. Do you remember what happened when Prabhupada was a child? If some grains of rice would fall down, Prabhupada's mother would have him pick it up. Don't let, don't just let the rice fall down. 
so very conscious like that. You know, this is Ishyavasya mood. Don't waste anything. Any, anybody like to offer some thoughts on this? Do you have any su suggestions yourself how you can utilize this Ishivasha principle? Yes? Okay, yeah, good point. In other words, we don't want to just be miserly. We don't want to just be miserly, but we want to understand that we're being economical for, for Krishna, recognizing Krishna. The Krishna consciousness has to be there. It's not just being miserly or frugal, but it's in, it has to be in Krishna consciousness. Okay, it's a valid point. Yes? All right. So, yes, there's no harm in using technology. Prabhupada was not against us using technology in the service of Krishna. So, as with the pandemic, we've become more dependent on technology and it certainly helped us, helped us a lot during this pandemic crisis that we can increase our hearing and chanting, we have the opportunity for more association. But with everything else, there's also dangers. You know, we see with the internet that, and with the, what do they call it, G4, G5, and like that, now people can use their mobile phones, they don't need televisions, and they can get everything on their mobile phone, they don't need the computer even hardly, but what, what are they doing with their mobile phones? You know, what are they, not everybody is in Krishna consciousness, there's a lot of, uh, evils also being propagated on on the internet on the on the cyberspace so it's not that technology is wrong but it's how we use it we ha people have to be properly educated and properly guided to understand these things if they use the internet just simply to pursue their sense gratification, watching Bollywood movies and going even more bizarre into the realm of pornography and such things, then it's very dangerous for society. And certainly these evils are very much there. So, we do have to educate people, trying, trying to awaken people to the danger. The danger is that you have the human life, you don't use it properly, you go into these darkest regions of ignorance, full of darkness and ignorance, right? You enter into the lowest, the lowest regions in the universe and can remain there. So people who are a little thoughtful, they will appreciate. Unfortunately, not everybody is thoughtful, but we try. It's our duty to try to awaken people, to get them to understand. So this is the message here in the first three verses, the importance of Ishyavasya, recognizing Krishna as the proprietor, being very careful how we utilize everything. You know, Prabhupada saw a lot of things in the modern society were really not so necessary. For example, one devotee had an electric razor 
for shaving his face. Prabhupada said, this is not necessary. He said, you don't need this. And then also washing machines. Washing machines, you know, Prabhupada saw how they, they, you know, back and forward, back and forward, back and forward, wish wash, wish wash. They don't really wash things. They just simply soak them in water and mix them around a little bit. Prabhupada thought these kind of things also, just not necessary, not proper. Mm. So, we should concentrate on things which are essential, you see. Uh, people have, they, <laughs> people have washing machines, they don't like the, to use their own energy for washing clothes. What happens? They end up going to yoga classes to get some exercise. If they would do their own laundry, they'd get good exercise, squatting down and scrubbing the clothes and so on. It's a good exercise. But to get exercise, people go to the yoga class and pay money. And they have the washing machine, put the clothes in the washing machine. So this kind of problem, this is a problem. A lot of laziness in the world and the, the comforts, the so-called luxury items are all there to make us more lazy. What we actually need is to be more energetic and to work more. We take care of the land, we have gardens, we don't grow anything. We can grow flowers, we can grow vegetables, you can grow so many things, but people just like to go to the supermarket and purchase everything. So Ishyavasya spirit is there, making proper use of the resources which are given to us by the grace of God. Anybody, can anybody give some suggestion how they can incorporate some Ishavasha principle in their home or in their situation in life? Hare Krishna. Okay, you do your job, but then the fruit of the work, what do you do with the fruit of the work? Okay, so what percentage of, the, of your fruit of the work do you offer to Krishna? A hundred, one hundred percent you give to Krishna. Our work, yes, well, okay. When, when, you study when you study nectar of instruction, uh, Srila Prabhupada writes there how it's the, the duty, it's, huh? So how much percentage are you going to give for charity? Twenty-five percent. Now, okay, Rupa Goswami recommends fifty percent. Yeah, that's men mentioned. Fifty percent should be given for the service of the Krishna conscious movement, or 
for the service of the Vaishnavas and the Brahmanas, right? Twenty-five percent for the family, twenty-five percent for emergency purposes, and fifty percent given in charity for the Brahmanas and the Vaishnavas, or for the Krishna consciousness movement. Uh, now, I know that that's, of course, that's difficult for people. It's a lot to give fifty. But that's what it says, that's what, of course, Rupa Goswami, he did that when he retired. So maybe at the time of retirement you can do that, when you retire. But uh, as you go on working, you can also think like that. This, this is, of course, that's, it's, uh, the Ishavasha principle. Prabhupada didn't enforce that, but he recommended that. Mentioned there, that was the example Rupa Goswami had set. Very powerful example. Of course, it's very difficult for people today because you have so many other things. And of course, your whole family are devotees. You're also maintaining them. You have to look after them. You can't neglect them. You have to look after them. But Yes, it's Ishavasya. It's all Krishna's. We have to recognize Krishna's proprietorship and our prescribed duty is working, offering the results to Krishna. Any other quest any other comments? Any other suggestions how you can become more in the mood of Ishavasya? What are you going to do? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, you're right. We have to keep the association very important. With the help of association, then it will help to keep us in Krishna consciousness. So that's a very good point. Thank you very much. Keeping the association of devotees will help us to be in the Ishavasya mood. Devotees will help us, right? They'll push us. Okay, so we will stop here and I'll meet you again this afternoon after some hours. Okay? Srila Prabhupada ki. Four, mantra, mantra four, yeah. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.